So, Lord God, amen to that. And we pray that you would help us to preach. And I already said amen. When Cheryl Pruitt was a little girl, she would uh, help out at... This is new pants that grew right up on my... She would help out at her family's uh, little country store. Every Tuesday since the age of four, uh, the milkman would greet her with these words. How's my little Miss America? She'd help him unload the bottles, and then sometimes he'd look her in the eye and he'd say this. One day, little girl, you're going to be Miss America. The milkman's words uh, took root in Cheryl's soul. And, and despite a horrific accident when she was just a child in which she uh, broke her back, crushed her leg, disfigured her face, had to have more than 100 stitches, in spite of several failed attempts, in the summer of 1979, Cheryl stood on the stage in Atlantic City and was crowned Miss America because of the milkman. He didn't say you're going to be Miss America because no one else will be Miss America. But you're my little Miss America. And one day you will be Miss America. That's the way milkmen ought to be. Wholesome, nourishing, and relentlessly kind. Planting seeds, planting dreams, dreams like seeds in in the souls of little girls. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Peter wrote, As newborn infants long for the pure logicos, logical, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is kind, Christos, good. The milk is good. It's gospel milk. We're made whole, we're nourished. We grow by drinking the milk, and we're to dispense that milk. That is, we're to to preach the gospel to all creation. So say it with me. Ready? I am the gospel milkman. According to Reader's Digest, Shirley Betchelder from uh, Lawndale, California, had become casual friends with Ben, her, her milkman, it was a November morning, 1962, and as, usually, as usual, Shirley was waiting for, for Ben. He, he was always cheerful, encouraging, wholesome, and kind, the prototypical milkman. However, on this particular morning, Ben just wore like a cloud of gloom. Shirley inquired, and, and finally with some embarrassment, Ben told her what, what had happened, how a woman on his route had left town with a $79 debt. Now, adjusted for inflation, I looked this up, that's $781 in uh, 2024. That is quite a chunk of change for a milkman. She was a pretty woman with six wonderful little kids, said Ben. She said she would pay me just as soon as her husband got a second job. What a fool I I was. See, Ben lost more than money. He lost some self-respect. The next time Shirley saw him, his anger and his bitterness had, had grown. He bristled as he talked about those messy kids that drank his milk. No pretty woman, no wonderful kids, no little Miss Americas, just a pack of brats and a word that shouldn't be said in church. Shirley really started to worry about Ben because Ben was in torment. After World War II, Corrie Ten Boom ran a home for victims of Nazi brutalities. She used to share that those who were able to lay down their resentments and their anger were also able to return to life in the world and rebuild their lives no matter how severe their scars might have been or or were. However, she said, those that nourish their resentments and their their bitterness, their anger, they, they remained prisoners to their own sour souls. It was as simple and horrible as that, wrote Corrie ten Boom. Well, like I was saying, um, Shirley really started to worry about Ben. 
because there's nothing worse than a sour milkman. Amen? One morning she said to Ben, I've got a way to make you feel better about that 79 bucks. She'd remember something that her grandma had always told her, and that was when someone has taken something from you, just give it to them as a gift. And then you can never be robbed. So she said, Ben, Ben, give the lady the milk. Turn that debt into a, a Christmas present for those six little kids. You're kidding, said Ben. He said, I don't even get a present that nice for, for my wife. Shirley responded, you know, the Bible says that Jesus said I was a stranger and you took me in, implying that Ben could be given the milk to Jesus, but Ben shot back, don't you mean she took me in? It wasn't your $79, Shirley. And that's an understandable point. It was his milk, wasn't it? His milk and stolen by this lady, not Jesus. Right? Whatever the case, Ben left even more sour than before. Ben, the, the sour milkman, the milkman gone sour. Ben wanted vengeance. That's more than $79. That's the indignity of being robbed. I imagine the more that he imagined that lady dishonoring him, the more he dishonored that lady in his own mind. You know how she plotted along with her husband to skip town with his money, the money from the stupid milkman. Now, he didn't know that. But he must have imagined that, and so he desired vengeance for that. And, and in this way, vengeance grows. About 1,200 Israelis were massacred on October 7th by Hamas militants. Since then, about 8,000 Palestinian children have been massacred by Israeli defense forces. And all of Gaza looks like a death camp. 2,977 Americans, or at least people from our country, died on 9-11 at the hands of Islamic terrorists, primarily from Saudi Arabia, look this up, and the United Arab Emirates, but none from Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, or Pakistan. As a result of post 9-11 U.S. military action, I've read that an estimated 432,000 civilians in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, and Pakistan have suffered violent deaths, and 3.8 to 3.8 million more have died indirectly through U.S. military action. I'm not saying that government should not defend their citizens. And listen really closely, I'm not blaming you or anyone. I'm just pointing out that we're not all that good at vengeance. And when we seek it, we make hell for others and for ourselves. I mean, Ben, the sour milkman, just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And Shirley kept bugging him, Ben, have you given the milk yet? Six days before Christmas, Ben arrived with a huge smile on his face. He had a sparkle in his eyes as he announced to Shirley, I did it. I gave her the milk for Christmas. Shirley said, great, but, but Ben, you've got to really mean it in, in your heart. I know. And, and I do, said Ben. And I really feel better. I've, I've just been thinking about those kids and how they had a whole lot of milk on their cereal this year. <laughs> Because of me. Because of a gift from me. It's more blessed, it's more happy to give than receive, said Jesus. He also said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so Ben's heart, like that of the Grinch, must have grown about three sizes that day. For he enjoyed what those kids had enjoyed all year. Milk. Ben forgave. He turned a debt into a gift. 
You just prayed, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And on this tree, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. At this tree, before we had any knowledge of good and evil, we all incurred a debt. You were probably, you know, about the age of two or three uh, the first time it happened. And at this tree, you were all forgiven from the foundation of the world. He forgave before you even took. He turned a debt into a gift. And, and now at this tree, every week we taste and see that the Lord is good. That by it we may grow up into salvation. And yet I know that we all struggle with forgiveness. Just like Ben the sour milkman. We just don't seem to comprehend what forgiveness is and is not. And you can tell by the little things that, that we say and by our rather sour disposition. You know, First Peter starts with this amazing proclamation. So we, we've talked about all this. But he says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has birthed us, begotten us, again, or from above, to a living hope. In verse 23 he writes, You have been begotten again, or born again, of imperishable spora, by the living and abiding word, the sperma. Then in 2.2, as newborn infants, and that may be part of our problem. We don't think we're infants. We think we're already grown up, and already saved. As newborn infants long for the pure logical, the spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is kind. Then Peter describes how we're all growing up into this living temple made of living stones, which is a body bound together in this sacrificial communion called life, which remember, Simeon, if you were here on Christmas Eve, Simeon talked all about that. He preached on that on Christmas Eve, so you should watch the video. But then Peter doesn't so much prescribe as describe how this body relates to an evil world filled with evil emperors, wicked slave masters, and arrogant self-centered husbands. He writes, honor, not dishonor, honor everyone. You know, as if everyone actually was Miss America. As if everyone really did have an imperishable seed, spora, eternal seed. He writes, if when you do good and suffer, you endure, this is grace, from God, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, as if you were Miss America. <laughs> when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He writes, let your world, your cosmos, remember, be the hidden man of the heart in the imperishability of the gentle and tranquil spirit. He's, he's describing and not prescribing because this doesn't happen by learning some new law and then oh, trying harder. It happens by drinking the gospel milk in the sanctuary of the soul. And now our text, 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally. Ta de telos in Greek. Literally translated, and the completion. And the telos. And the perfection, the one perfection. Jesus said, I am the telos. The end. Which also means the telos, I am. And on the cross he cried, to telestai, it is finished, it is ended. And he delivered up his spirit. He delivered up his spirit which has descended into you. I see how translators would translate this as finally, as if, you know, Peter were simply wrapping up a thought. But Peter is wrapping up all thought and all things in the end, who is Christ, in whom all things hold together. So, and the end, all of you, if we're reading this literally, and the end all of you, 
And, and then have is not in the text. <laughs> there are no imperative verbs in this text, and all these nouns are adjectives. So Peter isn't telling them what they must do, but who it is that they truly are. So, and the end, all of you, same thinking, co-suffering, uh, brother-loving, tender-hearted, and humble-minded. He's describing a living body. Not repaying evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. That's forgiveness. He's describing forgiveness. You know, most everybody loves stories of forgiveness in Reader's Digest regarding 79 bucks and a milkman. But when those stories involve blood and martyrdom at the hands of an evil emperor, or faithfully serving a wicked slave master, or staying married to an abusive husband, well then forgiveness just doesn't sound so sweet. I think part of that is because we don't know what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not, and therefore may not believe that we have actually been forgiven. And then, of course, we naturally think to ourselves, it's just impossible. Impossible for me to forgive. Well, forgiveness is just what Cheryl and, and Peter said it is. It's turning a debt into a gift, but it's not only that, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But let me first remind you of a few things that forgiveness is is not sometimes I hear people say I can't forgive that that's just inexcusable and yet if something is excusable aren't we simultaneously saying it is unforgivable for there is no actual debt to to forgive we use different words in different ways so you can always argue the details but hopefully you agree that number one Forgiving is not excusing. Hope you forgive me for how small that is on the screen, but maybe you can see it. Forgiving is not excusing. And number two, forgiving is not blaming. Has someone ever said to you, taken you out to lunch, and said something like, you know, I forgive you for hurting me so incredibly deeply. And you think to yourself, I didn't know that I hurt you at all. And suddenly I feel incredibly unforgiven. Forgiveness might reveal blame, but forgiveness is not blame. Remember what Jesus said on the tree in the garden? This has always fascinated me. I thought it was wrong at first. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You see, he doesn't blame as if we had knowledge of good and evil or at least complete knowledge of good and evil. Our knowledge was not finished, our, our knowledge of good and evil. The Romans and, and the Pharisees had some knowledge of good and evil, didn't they? Had some knowledge of good, good and evil, but, but they did not know that Jesus was the good and the life, including their own good and their own life. For if they had, writes Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.8, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So this is amazing. On the cross, Jesus doesn't blame as if we could have known better. Then he cries, it is finished, and delivers up his spirit. And then a Roman soldier confesses, surely this was the Son of God, for suddenly he did know better, but knowing better, there was nothing left to blame. So Jesus does not blame as if we knew better, but Jesus does not not blame us as if what we did was not sin. It's actually the very definition of sin. And once you are righteous, you will know. So forgiving is not blaming, but it's also not not blaming. So you see, Ben, the sour milkman, think about Ben. Ben, the sour milkman, didn't know why that pretty lady with the six kids didn't pay her bill. He only, he only imagined. And Ben, the formerly sour but now happy milkman, didn't know why the pretty lady with the six kids didn't pay her bill, and yet he forgave and had forgiven. It's, it's not dependent on what he knew, his judgment. And that's number three. Forgiving is not judging. 
And now this can make your head pop, but in the Gospel of John, Jesus clearly says, pay attention, I judge no one. And the Father judges no one. But all judgment has been given to the Son. Now, if you lie in the grass and stare at the clouds and think that one through, I think you'll realize that forgiving is not judging. And yet forgiveness is judgment on all of our unforgiveness. Whatever the case, forgiving is not judging, but it is surrendering judgment to God. And remember that God is at least two in one, right? Or better, three in one, three persons in one, three persons loving, loving, loving each other. And so there are no, there are no debts in the Trinity that are not simultaneously blessings. In other words, the Trinity is constant forgiveness, nonstop forgiveness. On Palm Sunday, Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. I think that's the moment we hear his words on the tree, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the moment that the heart of God is revealed. And it's good, kind, Christos. Forgiveness is not judging. Forgiveness is the judgment. <laughs> Number four. Forgiveness or forgiving is not forgetting. I mean, sometimes I'll hear people say, I just can't forgive that. I will never, I will never forget that. Ben forgave the pretty lady with the six kids. But he didn't forget that he was out 79 bucks, did he? Every time he checked his bank account, he was reminded. And yet when he was reminded, he didn't think, she stole my $79. He thought, I gave my $79. And he felt happy. Because it's more blessed to give than receive. Now, this will really blow your mind if you, if you give this a good thing. But in eternity, Jesus has wounds. In eternity, Jesus has wounds on his hands and his feet that he obtained in space and time. And he seems to really like them. They're the first thing that he showed to his disciples. But this is the weird part. He remembers. He remembers forever without end what happened. And yet, Jeremiah 31, 34, the Lord says, I will forgive their iniquity, iniquity and remember their sins no more. Now, lie in the grass, stare at the clouds, think that one through, and I think you realize that forgiveness is not forgetting, but remembering that sin is nothing. Nothing but the apparent absence of the presence of the good that we might know about the evil and forever enjoy the good. Another way to say that is I think that Jesus looks at the scars in his hands the way Ben looked at his bank account after he had forgiven that, that woman. He looks and he thinks, they didn't take my life. I gave my life. He looks at his hands and he doesn't feel any shame. He feels infinite ceaseless glory. He remembers that he was crucified. He does not remember your sin, for he knows it for what it truly is. It's the beginning of the revelation of grace. One day you'll look at every wound inflicted by sin, but you won't see shame. You'll see a fountain of glory. Forgiveness is not forgetting, but it is remembering that everything is good and it is finished. Number five, forgiveness is not trust. Because sometimes I'll hear people say, I can't forgive that. I will never, I can't forgive, I'll never trust him. Ben forgave that lady, but he didn't trust that lady. And he shouldn't have trusted that lady, at least not until he had an explanation, until he heard the story. See, trust is not something that you can just decide to do. Trust is something that someone must decide to create within you. The biblical word for trust is faith. 
And in scripture, faith is trust. So for about 1,400 years now, most of the institutional church has found ways, and I think sometimes really creative ways, uh, to teach that God will only forgive you if you choose to have faith. But all of Scripture teaches that you cannot have faith until you see that God has forgiven you. It's not your decision that determines God's decision. I mean, what a crazy thing to think. It's his decision that creates all things and all your decisions, your real decisions, and only good free decisions are real decisions. You know what they're called? Love. Everything else is like a bad dream of your own creation, construction. Forgiveness is not faith, but there is no faith without forgiveness. So imagine if that pretty lady found out somehow that Ben had actually forgiven her. Well, that knowledge would kind of judge her, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I mean, it, it would burn. But if she let it burn, that knowledge might also create faith. Faith that even if she was faithless to Ben... Ben would always remain faithful to her. And that revelation might actually change her heart. Well, number six, forgiving is not fixing. Sometimes I, I hear people say, they will never change. And so I cannot forgive. Forgiving is not fixing, but no one is fixed until they forgive. And you can't help God fix anyone until you forgive that someone. To fix is the Greek word ekdikasis. I love this. Ek means out or from, and dikasis means right or just. So ekdikasis means something like bring out the right or bring out uh, the, the, the justice, the, the righteousness. It, it means something like fix. Ekdikasis is usually translated as vengeance in the New Testament. And all of Scripture makes it abundantly clear that God says, as in the words of Paul, never avenge yourselves, never. But leave it to the orge, the passion, the indignation of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I will repay, kids, not you, me. He will repay. So how does he repay? Does, does he repay? Let's see if I can tuck my shirt into my pants here. Does he repay evil with evil? Is that what God does? 1 Peter 1.13. Peter told us that the Father judges impartially according to each one's deeds. But Peter just told us that we are not to repay evil with evil. So does God repay evil with evil? Is that the vengeance of God, our dad? I think the last chapters of Isaiah are the most beautiful description of the vengeance of God in all of Scripture. But they will utterly terrify you if you do not take them seriously and read the whole story. I mean, the end of Isaiah and also what Jesus says and then the, the revelation they describe the beginning of Jubilee and, quote, the day of vengeance of our God. They describe how the strong arm of the Lord, the Lamb of God, the scapegoat, comes in from the wilderness, bringing all of our iniquity, and he tramples the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, turning the vessels of wrath into vessels of mercy, bleeding wine that's blood and blood that's wine, which returns to the throne of God as endless praise. God's vengeance is forgiveness, which makes all things new. And so at the end of the sixth day, the edge of the endless seventh day, he cries from the tree in the middle of the garden upon which he is enthroned, Father, forgive! And it is finished. Tell us. That's the vengeance of God. 
And yet God does grant a provisional form of limited vengeance to the authorities in this age. That's what Peter told us in the last chapter. And those authorities include parents. But if they're good parents, all their quote-unquote vengeance must also be, it must always be, discipline. So listen closely, moms and dads. You cannot discipline your children unless you first have forgiven your children. And listen, all of you that have been abused. Call the police. Report the crime. But only after you have verbally announced into the heavenly places, in the name of Jesus the Christ, I forgive. Before God, we are all eternally forgiven, and yet we will all be disciplined. That's what Scripture tells us. God does not pay back evil with evil, for God himself is the good. However, God does allow us to experience the not good, which is the evil, for a time. And God does repay pain with pain, an eye for an eye, a tooth with a tooth, for a time, a time that ends in the revelation of eternity where all pain is transformed into pleasure. In other words, children of God, our Father will discipline you for a time, but only that you might enjoy him for eternity. Our dad is not retributive is the way a theologian would say it, but always creative. He is the creator of all that's good, and you will be good when it is finished. Love will cause pain for a time that you might thoroughly enjoy love for all eternity, the endless seventh day. Number seven, forgiveness is not something that you can do. In a concentration camp toward the end of World War II, Simon Weisenthal was summoned to the bed of a dying, blind German soldier. He confessed his crimes against the Jews, burning down houses and killing Jew after Jew, and then he begged Simon to forgive him. Simon Weisenthal never said a word. But he just sat there as he watched him slowly die. After the war, he wrote a book about the experience entitled The Sunflower. Read it in college, I think. And in, in the book, he asked this question, what would you have done? He asked it of like 30-some different scholars. And then Simon Weisenthal writes, who was I to forgive him? I. Nobody. Nobody had empowered me to do so. You see, Ben had the resources to forgive that lady a $79 debt. It hurt, but he had the, the resources. But what if that lady had taken the life of six million Jews? Who is Ben? Who is Simon? Neither one of them owns six million Jews. Who are they to forgive that? Or think of it this way. What if Ben never owned the milk in the first place? I mean, Ben didn't create the milk. He stole it from a cow. And Ben didn't create himself. He didn't breathe the life into this bag of dust that he called himself. He, he didn't create the life. Maybe he took it from God. And what if it wasn't really that lady that took the milk and Ben's self-respect? God didn't take the milk. And yet he made the lady that took the milk. And he certainly didn't stop her from taking the milk, although he clearly has that power. Whether or not she was to blame, isn't God always to blame? And therefore the one always to forgive, for lack of a better word? Which wouldn't be giving the milk back to him, which would be giving the milk back to him, right? The, the one who somehow gave it to you. 
Simon Weisenthal writes this, who was I to forgive him? Nobody had empowered me to do so. Do you remember what Jesus said to Simon Peter? Matthew 18, whatever you loose on earth, Peter, will be loosed in heaven. That is, whomever you forgive, I also forgive and have forgiven. In other words, they took my life and I forgave my life and now I'm empowering you to tell them I am the life forgiven to all. Then he told Simon Peter that he must forgive 70 times 7. That is indefinitely. And he told him about a king that forgave a debtor, an absolutely outlandish sum of money, and how the debtor subsequently went out and refused to forgive a fellow debtor of a piddly amount of money, pocket change, and so the king delivered that man to, quote, the jailers. Literally translated, the tormentors. Until that man paid all. All that he owed. And yet, if he had actually been forgiven by the king, what did he owe? Nothing. But apparently he didn't believe that he had been forgiven by the king, for immediately went out and demanded pocket change from his brother. And so the tormentor to whom the king delivered that unforgiving servant was ultimately himself. Oh, and he would be subject to the tormentors until he believed that he had been forgiven and so forgave. Nobody tormented Ben the sour milkman except himself until he forgave. And we can only forgive if we see that we have been forgiven. But unless we forgive, we're not forgiven. You are not uh, forgiven if you don't forgive. Unforgiveness is the unforgivable sin. And that's a sin that we have all committed. And so how can any of us forgive? Number seven, remember, we can't. <laughs> Apart from a miracle. Forgiveness is not something that we can do. I think that's why the verb, which we translate as forgiveness, a fiami in Greek, is also and more commonly translated leave, or suffer, allow, or let. Forgiveness is not something that we, we can do, and yet it's something that God has done and is doing. Forgiveness isn't our decision. It's God's decision, and we must let it happen. Forgiveness is giving life, and the life is in the blood, but the life is not our own to give. Jesus is the life, and he gives himself. This is forgiveness. It's, it's the thing, if you weren't here on Christmas Eve, it's the thing that Simon showed us. This is forgiveness. Christ forgives us. We forgive our neighbor. Neighbor forgives us. We worship God. You see, sacrifice does not pay for forgiveness. It is forgiveness. And forgiveness does not pay for love. It is love. And love, you, you think you have to love in order, you, love does not pay for God. It is God. If you do this fast enough, it becomes a river, a river of life. This is forgiveness, it's blood flowing through living tissue in a living body. You're the body. And you can't make it happen. You have to let it happen. You were a vessel of wrath, but you are a vessel of mercy, a blood vessel. You are a vessel of mercy, and mercy is the grace of God, forgiveness. 
Forgiveness is letting life happen. It's God's choice. It's Jesus from the bosom, the heart of the Father. It's the heart of God plumping blood throughout all creation. It's the river of life. You can't push the river. You have to let it flow. You can't make it happen, but you can stop it from happening. How? By refusing to forgive. That's our choice. People get all wrapped up in choice. That's our choice. But forgiveness is God's choice in us. Forgiveness is the grace of God that is God. It's the milk. It was a January morning. The, the holidays had come and gone. And Shirley opened the door to see Ben running up the walk, walk just yelling, wait till you hear this, Shirley. Wait till you hear this. And when he got to Shirley, he kind of caught his, his breath and then he explained. He said, I was on another route covering for another milkman when I heard my name. I looked over my shoulder and I saw this woman running down the street with a baby in one arm, wiping the hair out of her face with another arm and, and waving money in the air. It was that lady that owed me the money. She was yelling, Ben, 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 wait, I got money for you. I got money for you. And then she said, oh, Ben, I'm so sorry. My husband came home. He announced that he had found another apartment, and, and he got that, and he got this night job. And, and in the rush, I forgot to leave you our new address, but, but, but I've been saving, and here's 20 bucks toward my bill. And then Ben looked at Shirley and said, you know what I told her, Shirley? I said, um, that's Okay. It's been, get it, Ben, it's been, it's been paid. And she looked at me and said, it's been paid? Paid by who? And then, then I told her, paid by me. And then she looked at me like I was Jesus or something. And she just started to cry. And I, I didn't know quite what to do. So before I knew it, I put my arm around her and I started to cry too. Thinking about those six great little kids with their milk mustaches. The two of us just stood there in the street crying. They were both blessed. They were both growing up into salvation. And for both of them, I bet the milk tasted better than it ever had before. Shirley said, Ben, do you mean to say that you didn't take the $20? And Ben replied, heck no. That's the way milkmen talk because they're wholesome. <laughs> heck no. I gave it to her as a Christmas present. And it's more blessed to give than receive. We think that's true for milkmen at Christmas. But Jesus said it. And for Christmas, he gave us himself. So is it only true for debts under $79, this whole forgiveness thing? Or could it be true for something like the genocide of 6 million Jews? Corey Ten Boom, who ran the home for Holocaust survivors, was a Holocaust survivor herself. In Ravensbrück, Ravensbrück concentration camp, she, she lost everything. Or gave everything, depending on how you look at it. After the war, she was preaching in a church in Munich, Germany, on the, on the topic of forgiveness. And after the message, this man came up to her. He did not recognize her, but she recognized him. She said her blood froze in her veins. He'd been her tormentor. He said, Sister, I was at Ravensbrook, but, but now I'm, I'm a believer. I know God forgives, but could I hear it from you? Will, Will you forgive me? And he stuck out his hand. She had to forgive. But she couldn't forgive. She said she just stood there for what seemed like hours. And then in the sanctuary of her own soul, she just cried out, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. But I can't feel this. I don't have the feelings for this. You have to supply the feelings. So she did and he did. 
She writes that the feeling started in her shoulders, shot down her arm, into their joined hands as her whole being was flooded with this healing warmth, greater than anything that she had ever felt before. And then through tears, she just began crying out, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you with all of my heart. Maybe you believe that Forgiveness is true for $79 debts in Reader's Digest magazine in 1962, around Christmas time. And maybe you believe that it's also true for church folks, you know, who both confess that Jesus is Lord before they die. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And I think he meant all of us, dead and alive, for all the time. Now we're out of time, but maybe I'll, I'll tell you this whole story next time. If not, you can read it in the footnotes or something. But 12 years ago, my, and, and years ago, I think I told you about this, but my friend Michael had an experience during communion here at the sanctuary or in our old building. He wrote it all down for me and sent it to me, but he described it as the most wonderful thing that he'd like ever felt. He suddenly found himself standing in front of Jesus Christ and him crucified. I mean, body broken and bloodshed, and Jesus told him what to do. He forgave his enemies. And as he did, he describes literally descending into hell, taking them by the hand, and pulling his enemies through the body of Christ. The book of Hebrews tells us that the torn flesh of our Lord is the torn curtain in the temple leading to the Holy of Holies. It also tells us that the Holy of Holies is not of this age. It is the presence of the age to come, which contains an entire new creation, which is all that truly is, was, and forever will be, such that one moment in chronological time is not dependent on any other moment in chronological time. So in the age to come, everything evil is endlessly filled with all that's good, and so everything is good and is always finished and yet always new, for the end is the beginning and the way in between, and so everything that's anything is grace. It's the telos. All of space and time filled with eternity and unified under one head who is Jesus the Christ, the logic of love, love which is an endless communion of sacrificial delight which at first we recognize as forgiveness. Forgiveness is eternal life. Unless, of course, God ultimately pays back evil with evil and not with the good. Unless, of course, there are some whom God refuses to forgive. For if there are some that he doesn't forgive, well, then who are we to forgive anyone at all? And how could we forgive not knowing whether or not we are forgiven. And if we don't forgive, then we are unforgivable and therefore cannot be saved. You see, if hell is, is a place where God pays back evil with evil forever without end, well, then there's, there's no forgiveness, for there actually is no end. That there is no Jesus who prays, Father, forgive, enthroned on the tree at the edge of the sixth and the seventh day, the edge of time and eternity. I'm saying that believing in that kind of hell, believing in unforgiveness can get you damned for a time. Only for a time, because praise God, the end has descended into hell. Now our text for next week. Not repaying evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. For to this you were called, that you may obtain the blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord, the presence of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you? There's peace. 
Peter talking, had been killed by Emperor Nero, if you are zealous for what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, blessed. You're blessed. Blessed are those who suffer for righteousness' sake, said Jesus. Peter goes on, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. They feel shame, and yet they glorify God because of your good deeds. That's what he already told us. For it is better to suffer, he writes, for doing good, that if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ, for Christ also suffered once or once and for all for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed, he preached to the spirits in prison who formerly did not obey in the days of Noah. Just to be clear, he continues a few verses later, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. For the last 1,400 years, ah, sorry, the institution all has, our, our institutional church has argued in all sorts of ways that what I just read is not true. And I think it's turned most of us milkmen rather sour. <laughs> this is the milk. On the night he was betrayed, that sixth day, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and, and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant. Hebrews calls it the eternal covenant, the new covenant, in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. This is the milk. Don't let it go sour. And so as I was, let's get real practical about this. As I was preaching, names may have been popping up in your mind. Names of people that you need to forgive. And because of Jesus, you can forgive. And so under your breath, I mean, you can just whisper this so that the principalities and powers can hear. I want you to make this declaration after me, all right? So you don't have to do it out loud, but you can whisper it enough so that things can hear. Just say, in the name of Jesus, I forgive and then say the names. Now, one of those names can be yourself. <laughs> Your own name. If you really want to do battle with hell, you, you might want to do this every morning. <laughs> But now out loud, so all can hear, I want you to make this declaration after me on the count of three, okay? In the name of Jesus, one, two, three, okay, in the name of Jesus, I forgive everyone. God bless everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, Lord God, we thank you for who you are. Oh, I thank you that you are the creator, Father. And that you create all things with your word. Who's wrapped in flesh and standing before us. And who has descended even into the depths of our darkness where he causes us to choose you, Father. I thank you that you are the creator and I thank you that you are not done creating as long as we live in darkness and as long as we walk in sin and faithlessness and that the pinnacle of your creation is uh, you in us, faith in us, love in us.
I thank you that your word will not fail, but you will accomplish, Jesus, what you've been sent for. And I thank you, Lord God, even though I complain about this a lot to you, that you have called us into the service of proclaiming this good news to the world. And so, Lord, I pray that we would proclaim it with everything we do, everything we have, everything that we say, until that day we are joined with all of our scapegoats, all of our enemies, all of those that we have hated on the streets of gold, laughing and crying because of you and the eternal knowledge that you are good and you are the life and you have given yourself to us. In Jesus, amen. And so I'm going to finish my slide right now because I didn't have time. Forgiveness is letting life happen. Forgiveness is not something you do to get eternal life. Forgiveness is eternal life getting you. Forgiveness has not come to an end. Forgiveness has no end. Forgiveness is the end. So uh, I say this not as a threat, but because this is good news. This is a seed. Uh, Believe the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.